Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And this video should be important for you to watch, even if you don't own XRP. And the reason why is because we're seeing a blurring of the lines with the integration of the traditional financial institutions using digital assets. And I think I'm going to start off by telling you about a tweet that David Schwartz, the CTO of Ripple, put out on Twitter on Saturday. He was asked if he thought that his work with XRP was done. The answer was not yet, but it feels like it's getting close. And then he chose this gif of President Bush giving a thumbs up on the USS Abraham Lincoln. That was back in May 2003 when the mission accomplished banner was hung because this ship returned after a 10 month deployment. 10 months at sea, I just can't imagine. So seeing this really brings me to something I wanna sidetrack really quick, it's, it's personal, but it also, in looking at that ship, reminds me of the movie Midway that I saw in the theater last night. This movie was released in the U.S. back in November 2019. And yeah, sometimes the movies come a little bit later here, but it's a war film. It's about the Battle of Midway. And it is, of course, the turning point in World War II with the U.S. and Japan. It received many mixed reviews and it should receive many mixed reviews, but it was praised by many for its visual effects. And I can tell you the visual effects were worth it. I'm really glad I saw it. I just wanted to share that with you. Now let's go back to Brian Brooks. In this letter from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, again, another groundbreaking comment. The first comment that came that I think took everybody by surprise was back on July 22nd when the news came that banks were able to provide custody of digital assets. That clarity, I think, was huge. And now this letter addresses the authority of the national banks to hold deposits that serve as reserves for certain stable coins. And they conclude that a bank may hold such a stable coin, which can enhance payments on a broad scale. These stable coins are held in wallets that store the cryptographic keys for protection. In addition, this letter addresses that only the use of stable coins that are backed to a single fiat on a one-to-one -one basis is what they're opening upon here. But they do note, and this is important, that there are different kinds of stable coins. We also have stable coins that are backed by commodities or stable coins that are backed by another cryptocurrency. This is the second comment. We know there's going to be more comments. Brian Brooks has told us so, some coming in the weeks from now and some coming within mo the months from now. So, like I said, this letter is opening single fiat backed stablecoin, and it does say at this time. I think this is really key right here. It is opening those facts and circumstances at this time. Clearly, this is one of many comments to follow. So it's leaving room for stable back coins that are backed by commodities or another cryptocurrency. You should see this as a first step to the use of all types of stable coins. This is a bold step. And so because it's so bold, I think Brian Brooks is taking this change in a stair by stair step basis. So the point of this video, I want you to pay close attention to what David is telling us here. 
I'm going to zero in on a video that he provided back in October 2019. It is one of the proposals that he made for the use of the ledger. And in one of his proposals, he outlined how a collateralized stablecoin pegged to fiat, pegged to fiat, but having a backing asset. In this case, the backing asset would be XRP. And it is done so to guarantee that value. In some cases, you can redeem the stablecoin for the backing asset, or sometimes you can't. It depends on how you design it. But his proposal was that the stable coins would be perfectly liquid to XRP at face value on the ledger. And why is this important? Well, it's that liquidity. You can make the stable coin liquid could it, because it can be spent right on the ledger. The stable coin can be pegged to anything, actually. It doesn't have to be fiat. Uh, you could peg it to, of course, dollar or euro, but you can also peg it to stocks or metals. As long as you can get a price feed on it, you have to be able to get a, a price feed. That's, that's probably the requirement in terms of what, if you're going to choose another asset, you just have to be sure that you can get a reliable price feed. I want you to listen to the first two minutes of this because I think you're going to understand. Yeah, this ledger is powerful. And as these lines blur, the use of XRP just gets more and more exciting. Hi, this is David Schwartz, also known as Joel Katz, CTO at Ripple. Um, I recently released a list of suggestions for XRP ledger development, and I got a lot of questions about the stablecoin proposal, so I thought it might be helpful for me to walk through um, what I have in the design to give people a better idea of how I intended the system to work. Um, so first of all, it's a collateralized stablecoin. Uh, that means tokenized assets whose value is, are expected to remain constant in some unit. So if it's a dollar stablecoin and you have 10 of it, you're expecting its value to remain stable at $10. Um, these assets have a backing asset, in this case, XRP. That means that there is something that um, is supposed to guarantee its value. Now, in some of those systems, you can actually redeem the stable coin for the backing asset. In some, you can't. Um, what's interesting about this proposal is that the stable coins are perfectly liquid to XRP at face value on the ledger. So in other words, if you have a dollar in a dollar stable coin designed on the system, what you have is a $1 claim on, X, on, on uh, XRP enforceable by the ledger's payment mechanics. And the reason that that's important is with some other stablecoin designs, if the stablecoin isn't popular, it won't necessarily be liquid. If it's not listed on an exchange, if it can't easily be deposited and withdrawn, it won't be that useful. By the design of this system, the stablecoins can be offered through the on-ledger decentralized exchange, and they spend like XRP. So you don't need to find some way to make them liquid. You can just spend them right on the ledger. And of course, they can be pegged to anything that someone can provide a price feed on. Uh, fiat currencies are probably what people typically think of, like dollars and euros or whatever. But they can also be pegged to things like stocks or precious metals or any other value source. As long as someone can provide a price feed for it, you can have a stable coin pegged to that value. Okay. So it's a 20-minute long video. We're not going to listen to the whole thing, but I'm going to pull out just a couple of even shorter segments to really get you to understand. He talks about the critical components of this system, the operator, the price feed, the collateralized, collateralized positions, the redemption, the incentives. Uh, it's a video that's gonna give you an overview to see how all the redemption scenarios might play out. And if you are wanting to 
uh, view this in its entirety again, because I think it means a lot more than it did when it first came out. Now that we see these comments coming from Brian Brooks, I'll put the link in the description below. The next section I want to play is just really not even a minute long, but it's talking about the redemption portion. And it's going to look at that in terms of just the basics. It might be uh, also creating some greater demand, which I think is um, really interesting. Listen to this. The book does. A redemption is the conversion of a stable coin to XRP through the redemption system. Uh, it will be built into the ledger's payment logic through an IOU to XRP order book. Um, so there's already an order book to, con to sell the stable coin. People who want to buy the stable coin for XRP can place offers in the order book if they want. And there'll be a synthetic offer for redemption against the collateral pool. Uh, that provides assurance that the on-ledger payments can always be made by stablecoin holders. So if you hold $10 worth of XRP or you hold $10 in a stablecoin built according to the system, it should spend the same pathfinding. The first thing it will discover is that you can sell the stablecoin. The stablecoin might actually behave better than XRP because there might be people who want the stablecoin producing additional demand. So it's kind of like a value floor. It's at least as useful as an equivalent amount of XRP because you can convert it into an equivalent amount of XRP, but it also might be in greater demand for some reason. Well, he just goes so fast. So it can also be in greater demand for some reason. Well, I can tell you that if banks are more comfortable using a stable coin as opposed to using XRP because of the clarity now by the comptroller, and if the comptroller gives us this clarity to use a a cryptocurrency backed stablecoin, which I fully expect, then very well could create demand and very well could serve as a solution for this enhancement on a broad scale of payments that Brian Brooks noted in his commentary. The issuer, which would be the bank, they can issue a stable coin on the ledger. They decide what currency to peg it to. And then they can provide that price of one unit of drops of XRP, which also can be fractionalized. That's the flexibility. And you can build a collateral pool, this reserve. Because in case you do peg and there is a change in that currency, or there is a change in the XRP price, you want to have a little bit more in reserve to protect the system against the price shocks. I'm going to play now a section where he uses just an example. Let's say that it is pegged to Apple stock. You can get a price feed on Apple stock, right? So it's an asset that you could peg it to and then it could be still backed by XRP. All right, listen to this portion here. Also use the reserve to protect themselves from those shocks by investing it in the asset. So for example, if you had a system that was pegged to the price of Apple stock, the system operator might take the reserve and get leverage longs. Let's say they might buy options to buy Apple stock. And that way, if the price of Apple stock shoots up, which might be a problem to the system, the operator will now have the funds to back the system. Okay, so that Apple stock instead of fiat and the reserve can work to back that system in case of those price swings. So again, the issuer, the bank, will want to maintain that good reserve. Maybe he, he's, he makes the suggestion that maybe it's 150%. So you, you've got 150% XRP to the 100% value of the stable coin. And remember that that is if it's pegged to fiat or whatever asset you choose, just as long as you can get that price feed. The reserve or buffer drives the utility of XRP. Driving utility is important because it has a significant impact on demand, which has a significant impact on supply. Everybody always is, is like, well, how is, how is the use of XRP going to move that price? It's going to move it because there is simple supply and demand. And then the stable coin can be redeemed for XRP 
when you make a payment. Do you see? So the banks could hold the stable coin that's pegged to the US dollar, but backed by XRP and then redeemed only when they need to make a payment. And if there is a price swing that puts the collateralized backing at risk, the bank has the option to re-collateralize with more XRP. This is why David is a genius. All right, what are the benefits? Just about 30 seconds here. Let's listen to some of the benefits. Um, so what are the benefits of this system? So number one, it drives on larger ledger liquidity. These stable coins are liquid to XRP, and people who hold these stable coins will be making payments as if they had XRP. So there'll be more demand for liquidity from XRP into other assets. Um, and it provides derivatives with exposure to anything, stocks, metals, and so on. And you don't have to worry about getting these assets listed in exchanges or how people will acquire them. They can be purchased on the on-ledger exchange, and they can easily be redeemed. And so you can use them to buy any asset that's liquid to XRP. I think it's brilliant. Banks will be making payments as if they had XRP. More demand from XRP into other assets. Use these issued stable coins for any financial instrument, stocks, metal, etc. Liquid, liquid to XRP. So use them to buy anything. And it's basically you are, you are creating in a nutshell, you can buy and settle anything with a price feed using this mechanism. So fast forward to February 2020. You can see that David talks again, very, very short, like not even for a minute here, where this significant innovation is really exciting for him. This is a feature that he feels can launch a stable coin on the ledger. The liquidity is guaranteed by the ledger mechanics because it's tied in with XRP. Have a listen. That's why. You've suggested changes for the XRP ledger. Uh, can you give us an overview of what those changes are and what they might mean for the network? I've suggested a bunch of changes that fall into several different categories. Uh, one of those categories is like core consensus improvements. One of the things that I've said a lot is that proof of work is kind of a technological dead end. It, it works fine. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying that there hasn't been any significant innovation in it. There are also uh, changes that are in the form of new features. One of the features that I think is, is very exciting is a feature that would allow people to launch, um, well, stable coins are the obvious use case, but it's not just stable coins. It's essentially assets pegged to some external value. Features similar to that exist on other systems. But the interesting thing about this is that the liquidity is guaranteed by the ledger mechanic. The, the, uh, it's guaranteed by the ledger mechanics. He talks so fast, it's amazing how much he can get in, in in not even one minute. So now, as an XRP holder, you may understand how big this comment coming from Brian Brooks was today. And I know XRP has so many moving parts. It's hard to get your head around all these use cases. This use case, though, now that it has clarity in its first step, is huge. It really is huge. And do I think PolySign has a role to play here? <laughs> Absolutely. Did Ripple know in advance about this coming rule change, this comment, this letter? Well, let me just show you something here. I'm not sure if they did or they didn't. But if we look at an answer that Brad Garlinghouse gave in a town hall meeting with Tom Bremer, when he was asked, hello, Brad, if regulatory clarity will not come in the near future, i.e. six months, what is Ripple's plan to move forward? Is there a backup plan? And Mr. Garlinghouse answered, the greatest skill of entrepreneurs is to keep moving forward in the face of uncertainty. So there's a lot of truth in that statement because there's a lot of visionaries in this world that is building the future before it's built. And the Ripple team has many visionaries. So articles in March 
began to surface. And this one here is just one of many where they talked about the launch of this new feature, at least an effort to do the launch. And as we saw from the comment today from Brian Brooks, uh, it's much clearer now. When this article dropped and when the video from David dropped in October, I was feeling a little blurry with the whole situation. But now I feel it's very clear. And I also see that PolySign does have a big role. This service that they provide can handle all types of stable coins for banks. And you know, PolySign was built to provide secure, scalable infrastructure for financial institutions to leverage their digital assets. Stablecoins, for example, are just one of those kinds of digital assets. And they happen to be used in payment transactions. How convenient. So the groundbreaking patent that they have for security, storage, transactions, and payments, it is 100% understandable why banks would use this service to support their institutional grade solution as a turnkey. Because not all banks will want to custody or transact. And if the mechanisms are in place to provide this liquidity in their stablecoin, which don't inherently have liquidity, but if you tie it to XRP, it is going to have much more liquidity. And they will want to pay for this service instead of trying to do it on their own. Some will probably try on their own, but I think the majority are going to want to use a service. So it's really managing the collateralized stable coins and the fact that they can build it right into their services. I think PolySign is going to be very, very in demand. Okay, everybody, I'm going to jump to the fluff. Oh, before that, don't forget, Brian Brooks is going to have this Two Sides of the American Coin, Innovation and Regulation of Digital Assets on October 1st, 2020, 1115 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Jay Clayton, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, is going to join him. I think we're going to get a lot of information on that letter today. Well, Mount Fuji received its first snow. This is always big news in Japan, and it's really maybe bigger than years prior because it's so early. It's 32 days earlier than it's ever happened before, so it has this new blanket of snow, which is really, really beautiful. But wow, so early. What a great picture. This is from Lake Yamanakako, which I've done some um, fluff videos from this area. I love this part of Japan. It's just only about an hour away. And it's in the wine country of Japan. So I want to share with you something that's really cool, I think. It's a reverse vending machine. And what I mean by that are the drinks highlight the nutritional information as opposed to that design that might sell a brand or look like some tagline with some catch copy. I can't believe we haven't tried this sooner. So what do I mean? Well, instead of selling this side of the bottle, you sell this side of the bottle of water. Here you have an example of coffee. You're getting more of the nutritional and the ingredients and what you're putting into your body instead of just selling some fancy label. I think in today's world, this is what people want. 
They want to know what it is they're buying. So I don't doubt that this kind of smart marketing will be very successful. All right, everybody, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.